Good evening, 3B family. It is such a joy and a privilege to be with you one more time as we gather together for Bible studies again. God is indeed a faithful God, and we thank him for his goodness and his kindness towards us. It's so, so good to see all of you. And I'm grateful to God for his keeping care, for his loving care towards us, towards the children of men. We can certainly trust him. We can count on him because he is our loving God and father. And I just want to say a pleasant good evening to one and all. All of you who are on um, Zoom here with us and all of those who are over there in YouTube land. Um, really, really so good to have all of you this Wednesday evening, the 21st of um, April. Uh, today is, um, today was a beautiful day. I hope it was a beautiful day for you. Um, of course, it's one of those days where a lot of interesting things are happening around the world and um, in our country, um, some sad things, some good things, some bad things, you know, some noble things. Um, and as those things take place, um, we have to continue to exist and we have to continue to, um, you know, just keep pressing forward. But one of the things that we are always cognizant of is the word of God. And irrespective of all that's taking place, um, you know, there's something that holds constant and true for us. The word of God in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30 declares, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What, what, what an amazing consolation that we have in God's word as God constantly pulls us to himself, as God consistently refreshes us, as God consistently revives us and renews us, um, and just simply does in and through us what uh, only he alone can do. We thank God for that opportunity to draw near to him this evening, to come to him in a true way that our hearts can be refreshed and uh, replenished and be blessed. I'm going to open us in prayer um, as we go into prayer this evening. You know, one of the Sankeys are the hymns of the church of God um, is a very powerful hymn it says more more about Jesus more about Jesus I think is the title of the song more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me and it's good to just be here as we seek to grow more to learn more to know more about our savior Amen. Let me just open in prayer this evening as we get our hearts prepared for Bible study. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, God, we humble ourselves before you and thank you for the glorious opportunity that you give to us to call on your great name. We thank you for the invitation to come unto you. Lord, all of those who are heavy laden, those who are burdened and weary and needs rest, Lord, we give to you Lord, all of our struggles and our stress and our pains and our doubts and our fears this evening. And we say, Lord, would you have your way in our hearts and minds and lives? God, would you give us, oh God Almighty, that which you promise? Lord, we, will you, we pray that this evening, the great exchange, another great exchange would have taken place. Where, Lord, you will take the burdens from us. You will take, oh God Almighty, the struggles from us. You will take, oh God Almighty, whatever it is that would seek, oh God, to weigh us down and that you would give us, oh God Almighty, 
your easy and light yoke and burden. Father, we pray that even this evening, that your spirit will lead, O oh God Almighty, our evening's teacher, as he teaches us, as he leads us into the word, allow your spirit to guide him and guard him and cause your name to be glorified more than anything else, Lord. God, we just worship and praise and adore you. And we thank you, Lord God Almighty, for transformation of lives and hearts. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, for God, a renewing of spirits. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, for something fresh to take place, even as we bow before you. We tell you thanks now, Lord, for hearing and answering us. In Jesus' name we pray, and we say amen, and amen, and amen. Just before I turn over to um, Counselor Jermaine Lawrence, who will be leading us in our Bible studies tonight, I just want to say, if you are a first-time visitor to our Bible studies on a Wednesday evening, um, we want to say welcome to you. We have 44 persons on our YouTube channel right now. And if you are a first-time visitor, we would appreciate if you would just go ahead and type in the chat that you're a first-time visitor. It's your first time here in Bible studies so that we could you know, just officially big you up and welcome you. Um, it's really always nice to have first-time visitors or second-time visitors, but really, really good to have you if you are here and would like to welcome you. So just go ahead, reach out in the chat. And, and, and just before we even go further, it would be nice if you just send the link to a friend or a family member and just say, hey, 3B is on, Bible studies is on, join us as we study the word together. I'm sure it would be a blessing to somebody. Um, and for those of you at home, you know, don't be afraid to call your family members, you know, your spouse, your, ch your child or children and just say, hey, would you just tune in for us for the next, you know, couple of minutes as we study the word together. Um, Councillor Lawrence, bless you, sir. So good to have you. Yes, sir. Um, leading us in Bible studies tonight. Over to you, my brother. Thank you, Rev. Um, good night, everybody. I mean, it is it's good to be here. And um, it's good to see um, my church family. Um, even though we are joining virtually, it is good to, to see you all online. And tonight we are going to spend some time just reflecting on the whole idea of back to the Bible, yes? Going back to the Bible because we are focusing on um, the whole idea of scripture this month. And so we find it very fitting for us to just spend some time looking at um, the word of God. And so I invite you to, to open your heart, ask the Lord to open your spirit, and also that hope you have a pen with you and, 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 um, and a book and you have your Bible because we are going to use those as we journey together. All right, good to have you guys. Good to see those persons who are joining us for the first time and those of you who are always here online, welcome and thank you for being here. So as we look tonight, we are hoping um, to cover these areas. Um, we want to look at we'll just some background to the Bible and look at the uniqueness of the Bible. Um, look at the kind of approach that we are to take as we go to the Bible. Look at some of life's big questions and uh, what the Bible has to say about them. And of course, I will share with you one of my reflection, my devotional reflection. Let's trust the Lord for a good night and that we will be able to cover these areas. And so I want to just start out by reminding us that the, the word of God or the Bible is God's word for humanity. It is God's word for humanity. And so because it is God's word for humanity, we trust 
that the word of God will say something to that effect. And so we are going to turn our Bibles um, to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17. And of course, it's a passage of scripture that you know quite well, um, but I want us to look at it together. So I'm going to read it for you. Um, so you are privileged tonight to have me as the person reading the scriptures for you. Yeah, so give God thanks for that. Because the word of God comes to us tonight and it says, all scripture, not some, but all scripture, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That is the first reference. And then, of course, Peter will not be undone or done in this matter. So Peter also mentioned something to that effect. So James, so Paul was the one who mentioned that just now, um, the Holy Spirit through Paul. And Peter said, I must join in as well. Um, after all, I was in the inner circle. So why not me share something with on that matter as well? So Peter said, for the prophecies came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So both the apostle Peter and Paul, um, by the Holy Spirit, points out that the Bible is God's word. And so the scripture is the record given to us by God. And we have seen that before. So the, the, the scripture that we are that we just read and that you have in front of you is given to us by God. Therefore, the revelation and the illumination, and look at those words are, you know, you know, when if you want, you can go ahead and, and open your dictionary after the study. Not now, not now, stop, not now. After the study and look to see what those words might mean. I'm not going to spend much time on those tonight. But the revelation, the deeper understanding, you know, the, the what God intend for us to know um, comes from God. So we have the records and the revelation and the illumination of the record comes only from God. Now, if it comes only from God, it simply means that you and I have to consult God when we're studying the scriptures. That's the first thing right there. That in order for us to have a deeper understanding of the scripture, then the person who inspired the scripture has to be involved in the process. Yes. And then no. Um, so, but as you read and as you study the Bible, of course, we're going to draw on the same knowledge, skills, and competence we use in reading other documents. You know, so like you read the other book and you look at the, 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 um, the is and the, the but and the and and what those mean in sentences. Of course, you're going to look, are you going to use those same skill sets, um, the verb and the adverbs and the pronoun and all of those things. However, as you do that, okay, you have to do that. But as you do that, you must understand while the scripture was written by human hands, the ultimate author is God himself. So you cannot just use these skill set that you have, this knowledge that you have, the ability to use context clues. I remember when I was in, in school and doing English, I was not the best at it, I must admit. Um, but when I was in school and doing literature, then when we're doing poem, they say I must use context clues to understand what was being communicated by the person who write it, right? So even though you're using your context clues and your, your is and understanding the, the pronouns and the nouns and the adverbs and all those nice things, I want to point out and remind you that it is um, God who is the ultimate author. And so he must be consulted on the matter. Um, so with the understanding, with, 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 with the fact that the scripture was written or given to us 
by God, inspired by God, John Wesley, one of our one of the great um, men of the faith, um, said that scripture can only be understood with the help of the Holy Spirit. He never said he never he said only be understood. In other words, there is no other way to understand the scripture without the help of the Holy Spirit who inspired these 66 books. Hence, each time you come to the scripture, you and I have to ask God to help us to understand what we read. And so I know some persons might have it, you know, difficulties understanding the passage. And they will say, oh, I am not pastor. You know, I'm not Counselor Gail. Um, I am not Dr. Felicia Gray. I'm not a sister Sashimo, you know, who are able to look up, look at a text and, uh, and expound on it. And so I can't read the scripture. Sister um, Reverend Pinnock, Jeremy and Lawrence, and all the other persons who you see expounding on the scripture, they are only able to do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. And the good thing is that your position in the church, pastor, usher, no pastor, no usher, does not um, uh, make you closer to God than another believer. You see that? And so all of us as believers have the same, as it were, access to God. So God can speak to us and inspire us and help all of us to understand the scripture, even if we don't have a title. Okay, it's not the title that make us uh, understand the scripture. It is a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. So let's keep that in mind as we go forward that the Holy Spirit has to be an active participant and act, they have to play an active role in you reading and understanding the scriptures. So this, this gentleman, Alan Stips, who, who, who wrote a book called God's Word, and of course, there's some subtitle to it. Forgive me for not mentioning that subtitle. If you want to know more about that book, you can always link me. I will, I will tell you the entire title. So he has this to say, the Bible is meant to be a spiritual guidebook, a chart of the seas of life to show us the right way and to make us wise to salvation, to enable us to know the truth by which we can be set free and sanctified. Now, come on, Mr. Stiffs. That's a lot of information that you are putting out here. And I agree with you, Sir Stiffs. I agree with you because indeed it is the word of God that is going to help us to navigate the seas of life. It is the word of God that is going to show us the right way. Because there are many ways um, that is in this world and many different theories and many different worldviews. But the truth is, since all these worldviews exist and they are saying different things, it suggests that they're, all of them can't be true. All of them can't be right. And so how are you going to be able to find the right way? the word of God, because it stands um, as divine. It stands as God's word that will, that is forever settled in the heaven. It is the same word that God says that the scripture speaks of, of him, um, magnifying the word over his name. It is God's word to us. It helps us to help us to understand what it means to be saved. And it, of course, it helped to set us free because Jesus himself said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And of course, sanctification comes by the word of God as well. And so this is just a, 
a pictorial view. I know we have different persons. I know we have some persons who, who like the word, you know, who likes to see, you know, sentences and commas and all those different things. But there are some persons who are not into those things. They are into pictures. So I'm trying as your Bible teacher here tonight to show you different things. So I am here, I'm saying, no, I'm, I, just, I just put it now like a pictorial view. The Bible in the center, and these are what the Bible, according to Alan Stage, is saying. The spiritual guidebook, it shows the right way, make you wise to salvation, and help you to understand the truth. The same thing in a pictorial view. The Bible is unique. So of course, we would have look at some background to the Bible to help you to understand um, uh, the importance of why we are placing the emphasis on the word of God. So the Bible now as a book is unique and it is unique, but it is unified. It is unique, but it is unified. So I found this nice uh, picture of uh, this, of this, explaining different things right here and I borrow it and I'm using it here right now. So one of the things that they say, they say about the Bible that it is unique among all the books in the world. There is none like it. It stands, um, it is in a class by itself and it is unique, there is unity and uni it is unique and it is unified. So the scripture, as we know it, was written by 40 or uh, over 40 different authors, over 40 different authors. And these authors would include shepherds, like uh, David was a shepherd at one point, and um, kings, David was also a king. You talk about priests, like, you know, um, who, who, who was a priest now that, that wrote one of the scriptures? So, I, I don't remember that right now, but that's fine. Scholars like Paul and fishermen like Peter and, of course, prophets like, like Daniel. Uh, well, Ezra would possibly maybe be one of the priests. You know, so, so, so the scripture was written by different authors with different professions, different backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different settings over different period of time. Um, and though... The scripture was also written um, over a, a span of more than 1,500 years, right? So it's over a period of time that the Bible was written. It was written on three different continents. It was written on, on, on Africa, Asia, and, of course, Europe. And so it is believed that um, the first five books of the Bible was written on, on the continent of Africa, and, of course, most of some of Paul's book would have been written, some in Asia and some in, in Europe. And, and one of the things that is unique about the Bible as well is that the, the, the writings um, identify or put emphasis or, or don't hide the flaw of the heroes. So we have heroes in the Bible that we, we look up to and we salute. Now, other books would probably would have hide um, the shortcomings and the, the flaws of these, these, these men, because why would you want to put those forward? But not so with the Bible. For instance, King David was um, is celebrated as possibly the greatest king um, outside of Jesus to sit on the throne. But yet still David committed adultery, and it is written. And he tried to cover it up by killing um, the person's wife who he committed adultery with. Yes? And it is written. And countless stories. In fact, the genealogy of Jesus is, is one that, boy, I'm telling you, it really messed up, man. It is really, really messed up. But the Bible did not hide any of it. It is there in print for all of us to be able to see um, the Bible maintains, uh, main, remain unified in its message, even though it displays a wide variety of literary styles. So the Bible would have different literary um, styles, different, different types of writing is in the scripture. For example, um, Genesis um, is primarily a historical book. 
a historical record is you can find in Genesis, while the Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastics are books of poetry. And of course, the New Testament, there are letters um, that were written, and of course, the prophetic books and stuff. So, so the Bible has different books, and the different books that are in the Bible um, convey different writing styles. So those persons who are into poetry and they are into, you know, the arts and all of those different things, you can find it. Persons like Sister Jeanette, um, who is um, one of our historians, will, will love a book like Genesis because it speaks to history and persons who want to know how to write letters, you know, to different church leaders and so forth, like Reverend Pinnock will love the books of Paul, the epistles written to um, the churches. So it's very important that everybody can get um, something out of the Bible. So important. The Bible maintains a perfect unity despite the fact that its authors had different purpose in writing. So Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, um, had a different motive and reason for writing from Paul, from Peter, from Daniel, from Nehemiah, and from David, and so forth. But even though they had different motive, there was a sense of unity in what was being conveyed. And you, you can expect something like that when there is one central author, one person who authors the book. So for example, Moses trace his people history. David composed songs and worship. Paul gave instruction to church and sound doctrine. So what different things are happening. But it doesn't take away from the fact that each of these men had a role to play. And even though they were writing in different time, um, in different circumstances, with different um, uh, uh, educational background and experiences doesn't matter. There was there was a unity among what was written, and that is because there was one general author, the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible, uh, as we know it, we are humans, right? And so we have emotions and we express these emotions. The Bible, as it were, um, exhibits uh, a wide variety or range of emotions. So you can find yourself or the emotions that you express on a daily basis within the scripture itself, right? But even though the writers express this range of um, powerful emotions, Sums, um, it, it, it doesn't take away from the fact that they were being inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we can see, for example, there are intense anger being expressed in some of the Psalms. Oh my, when you listen to some of, uh, of David's Psalm, you are saying, my God, you can hear the anger in David. You can hear the, the anger in David. You can hear that emotion, that range of emotion. I've just, you know, it said, if it was a man, if, if it was in one of the Psalms, David was like saying, why, you know, he almost like he want God to just wipe out his enemy. I mean, sometimes, isn't that how we feel sometimes about the, the good things, the, the, the bad things in our life? Not, not, not that we want to wipe out people, but the bad things in our life. Not sure. Yeah, we want to get rid of some things from our life. And then we look at the Psalms, I'm talking about that. Then lamentation can um, convey great sorrows. Oh my, you know, you, 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 could, you could hear the sadness in, in Nehemiah's uh, uh, voice as he, as he writes, in Jeremiah's voice, as he writes the book of lamentation. And then in, in, in Romans, it, it, it display um, joy um, for knowing God and having salvation. Quite an, an, a, an, a nice array of, of um, emotions in the scriptures. And those are just some examples that this person chose to place here. So it's very important for you to understand that the Bible um, is unique, but it is also unified. 
I mean, my why, why don't you just, you know, maybe just take a time, take a minute and just write something in the chat that you notice that is unique or that make the Bible unified. Maybe you can spend a little moment now and just say a couple of things that maybe stood out to you right here as you think about the unity um, and the uniqueness of the scripture of the word of God. And so again, um, this earlier on, I show a pictorial view. <laughs> I'm trying here, man. Your teacher is trying right here. So I'm saying, you, you, you give a pictorial view of persons who just want to see graphics. But then you know, those persons who want to see, you know, the words and stuff, no, it is written here as well. So I won't go through it. So the Bible comprised of 66 books. And we know that 39 Old Testament and 27 in the New. Um, but yet still the Bible tell one cohesive story that reveals our creator's love and plan for a relationship with each of us. So everything that I expressed just now, the aim of all of that, the, the author's aim, main aim, is to, is to share with us the creator's love and his plan for a relationship with all of us. That is the essence of the Bible now. That is the essence of what is being conveyed over these 1,500 different, 1,500 years, 40 different authors, different continents, and I have those different literary devices and stuff that, that were used to, to express the scriptures. All of it was, was seeking to express to us or share with us um, the creator's love and his plan for a relationship with us. Isn't God amazing? He is amazing. Because he write, he, he inspired these men to write this book so that you and I don't have to guess and spell concerning God's love for us. So God used the, the writer's own writing styles and personality. He used that to show us who he is and what is it like to know him. So he used Peter's uh background and experience to write. He used David's experience to write. He used Moses who had an experience in the kingdom, what it means to be a, a, a king or a prince and what it means to be a shepherd in the backside of the desert. He used that experience that they had and Paul scholarly uh, uh, aptitude for learning. He used all of that and his aim was to show us who he is, and what is it like to know him. God wants to know us, man. He wants us to know him, and he wants us, um, he wants to know us, he wants to spend time with us. And that's one of the reasons why he actually writes the Bible, or inspire men to write the Bible. So this was just um, some of that information. So um, the, the Bible was written in different places, um, wilderness, palace, dungeons, prisons, islands, you know, various different places um, these men were as they wrote um, the scriptures. They were in different times, a time of war and a time of peace. So when, when, when David was writing most of his Psalms, there was war in Israel. But when, when, when Samuel, when, when his son Solomon came on the throne, there was peace in Israel. So when, 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 when Ecclesiastics and, and parts of Proverbs were being written, you know, Psalms of Solomon, it was a time of peace. But yet still, when David was writing the Psalm, his father, it was a time of war. And we talk about the fact it was written on three different continents already. And it was written in three different languages. Hebrew, which is the primary language that the Old Testament was written in. And, um, and, and, and Arabic, um, Daniel, one of one, some chapters of Daniel was written in Arabic as, as well as Hebrew, and the New Testament was predominantly written in Greek. So we know that the original um, manuscript was not English. Um, it was actually written in three different languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and, and Greek. And we know that the Old Testament is predominantly Hebrew, and the New Testament is predominantly 
Greek, right? The Bible, Mr. Juliet will love this now. The Bible read, reads as a factual news account of real events, places, people, and dialogue. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a book that you know a figment of somebody's emotion, um, imagination. It speaks of real activities. And of course, I know there are some references in the scriptures that is figurative. You know, it is not referring to a literal thing, but there are things that are written that are literal. So when you speak about the, the, the Red Sea and the path of the Red Sea and the path of the Jordan River on more than one occasion, it was not speaking figuratively. It was speaking literally. When you talk about um, Moses and, and, and Peter and Jesus and James and John, it was talking about real people. Not some makeup um, fictionary characters that, you know, we, 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 we conjure up with our minds. You know, no, real people, real events, real activities, and real conversations. So we can trust that when, when, when John record Jesus uh, speaking to the woman at the well, it was an actual dialogue that took place between Jesus and the woman at the well. When, 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 when we hear the conversation with Jesus and his 12 disciples in the upper room, as is expressed in John 13, it's a real conversation. Real dialogue was taking place. And so you have to understand that the Bible is not just a nice little book that, you know, somebody just come, come up and who is very creative and able to, to think and, and, and reason or come up with. No, it was speaking of real activities. And historians and archaeologists have repeatedly confirmed its authenticity. In other words, they are persons who don't have a who do not like, I was going to use another word, but I am on, I'm in Bible says, so let me just calm down. Historians and other persons who, who don't care about Christianity, who don't have no liking for Christianity, they, they write things that, you know, um, shows that the scripture is actually um, real and something that you can, you can take to the bank, as it were. You can use it as a point So I think we lost Councillor Lawrence there for a minute. I'm so sorry, my internet got disconnected just now. I figured, I figured. Well, it's all right, they can go back. We can go straight back on. Let's go straight back on. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So. 
All right. Um, I am back. Sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. So what I was saying before I was, um, when we got disconnected just now, was that they are able to construct um, the, the, the activities that are written in the Bible from non-biblical sources. In our world, there are enough information by historians, persons who are true historians and persons who have studied um, history. They are able to construct activities and events that are written in the Bible by persons who do not like Christianity, do not like Jesus, do not want to do anything with Jesus. So it shows or it demonstrates that the Bible is actually a real and factual um, account of things that has taken place. So we have to, we can trust the Bible. We can trust the Bible because of that, those realities. All right. So I want us now, therefore, to look at the fact that the Bible is so unique and it shows unity. And it demonstrates that there is some, there is, it, it can be, um, it is authentic. If it is that we are not going to um, get anything from the scripture, then we need to therefore have an attitude. We need therefore have a way of approaching the Bible so that we can get the best out of the scriptures. So I'm going to share with you now a video that I found very useful um, in how we can actually approach the scripture. Let's listen to this. Listen to this, um, gentlemen. The Bible is not just another book, and so we ought to approach it in a unique way. The, the Bible is God-breathed. That's what this passage from 2 Timothy 3.16 says. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's inspired. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible is inspiring. Now, it is inspiring. But whether anyone in the world is inspired by the Bible, the Bible is still inspired itself. It's, it's God's word to us. It's God exhaling, God opening his most hallowed lips and speaking to us. So this word is God wor God's word, and this word is exactly what God wanted to be written down in Holy Scripture. So that means we ought to approach this with a special reverence and with a special care. So we come to the Bible very carefully. We want to be diligent. We want to be prepared. We want to take it seriously. And we also come with, with a special reverence to this book because God is speaking to us. There's a submission to the word that one of the ways that, to think of the Christian faith is that we stop telling God what to do and God now speaks to us. I think a uh, theologian once said that, you know, to be a Christian meant you put your hand over your mouth and we're silent. And it doesn't mean that we can't ever cry out to God. Certainly the Psalms are full of that, but it means that we approach scripture with this reverence, wanting to hear from God, submitting ourselves fully to the word of God. And I like what, what it says here that when we come to it, the aim is not just information. It, it, it's never less than information. We're not against information. God uses that, but it's more than just information we're trying to get from the Bible. Uh, we want faith. That's what God wants, to accept this with faith so that there's a real delight in the word. There's a desire for it. There's a dependence upon it. We're embracing it with faith and then storing it up. So I love the line about John Bunyan that said, if you would prick him, his blood would be bibline. He was so full of the scriptures that it came out of him. That, that's what we want, that we store it up and then we practice it. Because after all, Jesus said, if you love me, what? If you love me, you will have a tingling sensation in your heart. No, he didn't say that. Those, that's wonderful. But he said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So if we are serious about loving God, we must be very serious about 
obeying God and obeying his word to us. That's the aim, to be transformed by it, to embrace it in faith, to worship at his feet. Really, in the simplest form, we ought to come to the word of God with the same sort of attitude with which we'd come to God himself. So if God was speaking to you, which he does in the scriptures, if God was opening his mouth to us, how would we approach him? Well, I think we would listen very carefully. We would listen very diligently. We would listen very submissively. We would listen expectantly. And we'd listen with an aim to love and obey. Thank you so much, my brother, for sharing that with us. May God continue to bless your ministry as you continue um, with the scripture. All right, so we're going to continue with our studies. So what this uh, gentleman was essentially saying is that there is a, we are supposed to have certain reverence when we approach the scripture. And we are not just going to the scripture for information, um, for the sake of information to be able to quote some scriptures at the end, but we are going to meet with God. And we are seeing the scriptures in such a way as if it was God literally speaking to us, right? So there are certain approach that I feel um, we have to take when we go to the scripture. One of them is that we must come to the Bible expecting to go. The truth is we are, we were born in sin or shape in iniquity. There are things in us that cannot stay, that needs to go. And God himself is willing to perform those, as it were, operation to bring us to the place where we need to be. And so the word of God, you know, if it is used in a way um, that, you know, is reverence and we approach it with certain appreciation for who, um, who, who wrote it and, um, and who inspired it, rather. We, we, can have an ex we must have an expectation of growth because the word of God is like both milk and solid food. So let's go to scripture. Let's go to the Bible for that because the Bible is very important. Let's see what, my, what our brother Peter has to say. I did tell you that you need to have your Bible with you, yes? So let's see if you have your Bible with you. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. And so Peter says, as newborn babes, and I have some my new believers here online, God bless you, my brothers and sisters. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. So the, the, the word of God has within it the ability to, to help, to nourish you. The, the first six months of life, um, the World Health Organization um, says that, you know, um, the breast milk is all the nutrients that the baby needs for life. The baby does not even need water for the first six months of life, only breast milk. And the scripture is like breast milk. So when you just come to the scripture, when you just come to God, the, the word of God is like breast milk. It, 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 it gives you all of the energy. It gives you all of the nutrients that you need to go spiritually. But as you grow and as you mature, just like the baby who moved from six months to seven months to nine months to 12 months to a big man, a big woman. The, 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 the need for food and the need for energy changes with age. And so as you grow, as you mature, the word of God also moves um, from just a nourishing, refreshing milk substance to hard food. Let's listen now to Brother Paul. It seems like Peter and Paul um, um, has something that they want to share with us. Well, I'm not sure. There are some theologians who believe that Hebrews was written by, by Paul and some said it was not. But whoever it was written by, he has something to say.
to us. It says, this is what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 5 verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So those persons who are in a state of newborn babe, my new believers come to mind when I think of that, and those persons who want to understand the deeper things of life, uh, my council members come to mind when I, think of, when I think of that. Both persons, or both group of persons, can use the word of God to grow, to mature, to develop, to provide the nourishing substance that we both need when we, whether we are young in the faith or we are mature. So the word of God, it, it, it helps um, everybody, those who are young in the faith and those who are mature in the faith still need the word of God. So it doesn't matter how long you have been in the church and how many times you have preached a sermon, you can never ever reach a point where the word of God is no longer relevant or important for your nourishment. Because you will never, as, as long as you're alive, and I'm speaking now as someone who has studied nutrition, as long as you're alive, you cannot survive without eating food. So a 90-year-old person versus a one-day-old person still need food. And so whether you are a newborn babe, a couple of days old in the faith, or you are a mature bishop, um, uh, pastor, and leader, and deacons and stuff, you still need the word of God. So you come to the word of God expecting to grow. Because the word of God has the ability to give you the nourishing substance that you need to grow. Let's see what else we can, attitude we should have when we come to the scripture. You must come to the Bible as well. With an under, with you come to the Bible for understanding and direction. We speak earlier how the, the world is dark, and there are many roads, and there are many twists and turns, and we all want to know where we want to go. We all want to have a sense of understanding and direction. If you want to move, like for example, when I just came to to Chilon, and was moving around in Chiloni, I had to be traveling with a colleague of mine because I never understand. I never know the way how to get to different places that I needed to go for work. So I had to identify somebody who knows the way. And as the person shared with me the way, now I can go to these places by myself. And so the word of God has that ability to help to share with you a sense of direction and a sense of understanding. The word of God acts like a counselor as we go to the psalm. Therefore, let's go to Psalm 119. Let's go to Psalm 119 and verse 24 to see what the psalmist has to say on a matter because the word of God is truly a counselor. It really counsels us um, in terms of how we, what we are to do and so forth. So let's see what Psalm 119 and verse 24 has to say. If you have, if you reach there, if you reach there, say amen. Type amen in the chat if you are there. Psalm mm -hmm. 119 verse 24. Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. And of course, the scripture provides light for the journey. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, said Psalm 119, verse 105. And so the darkness of our world, how dark our world is, in order for us to, to, to see where we are to go, we need the light. And the light uh, my brothers and sisters, is the word of God. The light is the word of God that gives us direction. And so when you go to the scriptures, when you want to know 
what who God is and even who you are and what is what is life all about, you can go to the scriptures because the scriptures is there to provide direction and understanding. But not only that, but you must come to the Bible for correction and purification, for correction and for purification. In other words, there is a, there is a part of us that really and truly needs um, to be um, purified. That need, and every now and then we need correction. Every now and then we need uh, somebody to to tell us that we are wrong, and that that which we have done was not done according to sound wisdom. So correction is needed, and purification is needed. So the Word of God says James is like a mirror where someone go and see him himself. So let's go to James now. Let's go to James 1. I, I, we have to go to the scriptures, you know, because we can't talk about the Bible. I don't want you to see. I want you to see for yourself that um, what I am saying is not my word, but it is scripture. It is actually in the Bible. Listen to what James have to say. James the Apostle in um, James 1, verse 22, 25. But be he doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So version says mirror. For, for, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forget what manner of man he was. 25. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So the word of God is like a mirror that helps to share with you um, what is going on. So as you read the scripture, says one theologian, the scripture is actually reading you. You are able to see yourself, you know, the flaws that exist as you look into the word of God. This evening when I was coming on here, um, my beautiful, lovely wife said to me, you know, um, you, you need to just wash your face. You know, I'm, I'm being very, you know, I'm disclosing things here now. And so I went into the bathroom and I washed my face. So my face looked cool and nice. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, wife. You know, so when I, when, I wash, when I was washing my face, I was able to see clearly what she was talking about. I could not see exactly what she was talking about because I was not looking at my face. But as I stand in the mirror in the bathroom, I was able to see some of the things that she was seeing, the grease and whatever else was on my face. I was able to see it and then now use an action now, soap and water and whatever else there is to wash my face and dry it off. And that's how the word of God is. If you are not reading the word of God, you're not going to, you're always going to think that you are right. You're always going to think that you don't need any correction. You don't need to be purified. But as you read the scripture, you get to see, no man, but you did wrong this up. That's not how you're supposed to be here. The scripture never says you're supposed to do that. So you have to read the word of God because it helps to show um, direction. James, um, Jeremiah, no. Oh my God, that brother there is a, He's a prophet of the prophets. He's one of the major prophets of the Bible. Um, and he says something. Um, God says something through him, actually, in Jeremiah 23. When I was reading it, you know, for the first time, I was saying to myself, what is going on here? But then as I go deeper, I get an understanding as to what is happening. So this is what Jeremiah 20, 23, verse 29 says. This is God now. It's not my word. Like as a fire, said the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in, pre in pieces. Now, of course, when you think of fire, you think of purification. Not true. You think of purging out and burning out impurities. So you think of a rock, you know, a, a, a precious stone and a diamond going through the fiery furnace and, and to be purified, to uh, get rid of all the infirmities. So the word of God, if it is used correctly, 
is able to remove all the impurities. And as it removes those impurities, it is also hammered. Those impurities are also hammered because the word of God is acting both as fire and as a hammer. And so you cannot. That's why it is. That's why Jesus would say, by a fool, you shall know them. It is someone who is spending time in the word and being a doer of the word. It is hard for you to take. It's hard for you to, um, to, to mistake those individuals. You can always tell when somebody is, 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 is a, a doer of the word and someone who is not. Because as you spend time with the word, the word of God is, is, is revealing things and is removing things at the same time. Spend time with the scripture because it helps to correct you and purify you. It's like a scalpel by which God's, God performs spiritual surgery on the heart. My doctor friends might be here tonight. I, I can think of a, a couple of them who are performing on heart surgery. The scripture says, thy word is like a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing, to the dividing of joints and marrows and bones. The, the, the word of God goes into the deep intricacies of our core and it removes what is there that should not be there. The truth is, says Jesus, that whatever is, whatever comes out of you, that is what defiles you. It's not what goes in. No, the fact that it comes out is an indication that it is inside. Ah, and so the word of God now comes and removes those little things. It performs a surgery to purge your heart, to cut away the selfishness, the pride and the jealousy and the malice and the bad mind and the biting and the fornication and the adultery and all the whole of them. It was cutting them up, cutting them away. And it is now revealing or giving forth now a heart that is ready and prepared to do what God has in mind. The word of God is there as an, a, 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 a tool that God used to purify us, to correct us. But finally, um, it is used by Paul now in Ephesians 5, verse 23, uh, verse 26. And of course, some of us um, gentlemen who are here, husband who are here, um, potential husbands who are here, you know, sometimes we spend time looking at the uh, the, the passage in, in Ephesians 5 that speaks to women being in submission to their own husband. You know that scripture there? Mm -hmm. We quote it all the time, man. All the time we quote it. But not knowing that the, the, the passage speaks more to what the husband ought to do. So this is what Ephesians 5 verse 26 says. That he... That's the husband now speaking of God here, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So the, 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 so, 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 so the word of God is doing a, a master work. I don't see that one. You don't see that? <laughs> the word of God is performing a surgery. And it is also washing us. So after I done perform the heart surgery and all of the different, I want to use the word mock. So I'm not gonna, I'm not saying mock here. I'm using another. I'm trying to find another word to use. But you can now use your English. Those persons who are good at English just use that now to find out what other word could be used. So mock. But it, it, it's removing all of the, the debris and all of the different things that was the, after you done the heart surgery. You have to now use some water, man. To wash away, to wash away, not true, to remove from the person any impurity that is there, any waste byproduct that is there. The word of God is still performing another operation. It is now cleansing. Ah, it is now doing a final thing of removing whatever is inside so that you and I can be presented as pure, as spotless as God wants us to be. Approach in the Bible has to be uh, very, very important. You can't just approach it any, anyhow. Um, you must come to the Bible, not just to, for correction and for purification. And those things just sound uh, like you, you are 
we can call it now, you are you are performing a surgery and it is painful. Of course it is. I mean, when, when God is cutting away some of our, our old ways, it is not going to be pleasant. But the word of God can also be used for pleasure. Because God's word is like honey. <laughs> sweet to the marrow man, sweet. The word of God is not just uh, one that causes pain when it is removing what should not be there, but it, it brings pleasure, it brings joy, it brings a, a, a mode of happiness and, and celebration. Have you ever read, take up a scripture and read it, and as you read it, you have to just laugh to yourself. I said, my God, it's almost like you have been reading the scripture for years, and the Lord just, just like a light bulb moment, ding! And it's like you can't help but just laugh to yourself. And I said, oh! My God, you can't wait to go share it with your friends. I have a couple of friends um, who is on here tonight. And um, every now and then they know, you know, I get super excited about something. When we get excited, man, you know, we can't wait to share it. And sometimes it can disappoint them because sometimes they cannot joy with me how, you know, of sharing it. Some person really get the joy. You get me I say? Yeah, some person really fully um, understand the joy. But, but when you get it, man, and all of us get it together, you know, my God, it's sweet. It's sweet. The word of God is sweet. Jeez, that's the sweet. Man, it's sweet, man. It's sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet. So after I perform the surgery, it now comes as something that brings pleasure, that makes you want to just rejoice and just smile and just be happy. Because the word of God is like that. Because how can you not experience joy and pleasure? When the, when the scripture says, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. How can you have God who, 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 who writes the scripture or inspired the men to write the scripture, um, who is filled with joy? How can he not allow you to read the scripture and experience that joy? It is impossible, I tell you impossible for you to read the scripture and not get some sense of joy out of it. Approach the word of God, man. Approaching the word of God. So if you come to the Bible with this kind of attitude and expectation, you will be changed. You will be transformed. So many of us want to, want to be changed, want to be transformed, want to be like Jesus. And it's a good attitude to have. It's a good mentality to have. But you, you will not be changed. You will not be transformed by just thinking about it. You have to spend time with God through his word so he can do what he needs to do so you can be changed. The word of God is God multifaceted instrument for conforming you to the image of his son. So the same word that is bringing pleasure and joy to somebody is performing a surgery on somebody else. The same word that is giving correction um, to you here is also purifying you here. The word of God is God's instrument to help to conform you and transform you into the image of his son, that is God's ultimate plan to transform you into the image of his son. That is his will for your life to conform you into his image and into his, his likeness. So let us now go quickly to life big question. So the first question we want to ask ourselves is who am I? You know, these are there are four questions that um, is you generally asked, um, um, generally uh, asked by, you know, general people of life, you know, um, persons who uh, want to find answers to life. There are four questions that, you know, different, you know, worldviews and stuff must answer. One of them is, who am, who am I? Well, the scripture says that you are an intended intended creation, lovingly and fearfully and wonderfully made. 
That is what Psalms 139 is all about. It speaks to the fact that you were not just a, a figment of somebody's imagination, but you were well thought about. You were well loved and cared for. God had a plan when he designed you. He was thinking about you. So even though you do may not look like how you feel you should look, and you may not have the pigmentation that you feel you should have, or you may not have the size nose that you feel you should have. The scripture says that God um, knit you together in your mother's womb and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So every now and then, when that little self-esteem is coming on, when you're not sure what is going on with um, your emotions, it's all over the place. Why not spend some time reflecting on Psalm 139? And it will tell you who you are and how loved you are my God. God answer, the scripture answer the question as to who you are. You are an intended creation, um, lovingly and fearfully and wonderfully made. But what else are there? What is the other question? Where do I come from? Of course, uh, you know, other world you speak about why the whole Big Bang and different other things that they came up with, evolution, we come from monkey, and all of those foolishness. The scripture says that we were created by God from the dust of the ground. When you look at Genesis 1, you are seeing God who is all powerful, forming by his word everything that there is. And towards the end of Genesis 1, the scripture says, you know, and God, then God said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Nowhere else or nothing else in all of God's creation bears the image of God. Now, understanding that image is something that I will allow or leave Reverend Pinock to deal with. You know, that's a theological thing that I will leave Reverend Pinnock to deal with at another time. But just, just understand that you are the most precious of all of God's created beings. Not even the angels were creating this image. Think about the, 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 the night sky. Think about the vastness of the, of the creatures in the ocean. Think about how, 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 how the, the beautiful and the, and the ocean and the, and the sea and the angelic being and all of those things. And all of those stands in awe of you and I because we bear the image of God. And one of the most important thing for me um, um, in terms of giving me a uh, purpose and giving me um, a sense of dignity and worth and value is that the most important being in the universe became one, became somebody like me. He took on humanity. He never transformed into an angel. He never take on the, the, the attitude or, the, or the, the composition of the sun. The only image that, um, uh, that God, the creator, the most powerful being in the galaxy take on is humanity. That for me, give me value. It gives me a sense of dignity and worth. And so even if you don't like me, you can't help. You can't do anything about it because you were never created. You never created me. God created me for himself. I never come from no monkey. I never come from no big bang. I came from God. I was a concept. I was a thought in God's mind until God um, put that action, put whatever the, the, the thought he had in mind of me into action. And I, my, my genesis in terms of how I came into this world may not be pleasant. It may not be an enjoyable moment for my parents and my mother, but at the end of the day, God had a plan for my life. I was created by God from the dust of the ground. Where do I come from? The next question is, 
what is my purpose? Why am I here? Why am I on earth? Well, the scripture says that we were created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's the essence. The, 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 the writer in, in, in Corinthians says, boy, we must, everything we do, we must do for the glory of God. In other words, you have to recognize that you were created by God for God, for to live and enjoy his presence forever. And it is so uh, clear in scripture that Jesus came to earth. He died on the cross for your sins. Uh, to, he took your place so that you can enjoy the presence of God forever and ever. In other words, if it was a situation where you, you were just created for just for us to hear and know, then there'll be no reason for Christ to come in and die. But the fact that Christ came and he died on a cross gives indication that there is something more deeper than just the here and now. We were created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever and ever. Final question that is asked is what happens when I die? Well, the scripture is very clear on that. Heaven, if you accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. But hell, if you reject Christ as your Savior. In Revelation 20 and verse 11 to 15, it speaks about the, the throne and the great judgment and how everybody will be standing before the judgment seat of God. And then the great book will be open. And there will be another book called the book of life. And every name who was not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. God is a just God. And because he is a just God, he has to execute justice. And justice means that he has to call what is wrong, wrong, and call what is right, right. So the scripture speaks, Jesus himself speaks about the, the wheat and the tears growing together until the day of harvest. So there is coming a time when there will be a separation. And that separation will be for persons to enjoy God's presence forever and persons to be in, in eternal tarmish, in term, internal term, termin, termin. You're going to be tormented forever. Right? So you have to recognize, brothers and sisters, that when you die, that's not it. There is more to life than the here and now. That here is only a small portion of what we refer to as eternity. Time is only a short span compared to eternity. But what you do here determine what happens in the life to come. So the scripture says those persons who accept the sacrifice for sin, which is Jesus, and place their faith in him will have eternal life. But those who do not will be um, separated from him eternally in hell, um, bearing um, torment and torture. You don't want that to happen to you. So if you are here tonight and you do not have, you do not, you have not yet placed your faith or your confidence in the man Christ Jesus, I encourage you to do so now because the scripture that we're talking about makes it very clear that when we die, there will be a separation. Some of us will be enjoying God's presence forever while others will be separated from God forever. I trust that you would have, you would have made that decision and that you are continuing to trust in the Lord and Savior. If you're not here, if you're here and you have not yet done so, you can take the opportunity to write in the chat, um, comment on Facebook. Um, someone will reach out to you that you, if you have, if you are making that decision to follow Christ, because the scripture make it very clear. And if you can believe anything else about the scripture, if you believe um, that boy, you know, the wicked or penit perish, and if you believe some other nice, beautiful things about the scripture, then you must also believe the part of the scripture that speaks about the judgment 
and is coming for those persons who do not yet have a relationship with God. Let us trust God um, by relying on his word. Final thing I want to do now is share with you um, <clears throat> something um, from my own personal devotion. So I am not going to even, I have not even edit this. I have, I have just, I've, I've wrote it, I wrote it down some time ago. And I'm not, I, so if you hear grammatical errors and all those things, that's fine. You know, um, I am just sharing with you what I sense the Lord was saying to me as I spent time reflecting on, on the scripture. And the title of my of this devotion is The King, the Bride, and the Tyrant. The King, the Bride, and the Tyrant. Just want to share with you uh, something um, that is revealed to me in the scripture. The aim is not to, to show superiority or to say, oh, you know, this is this is what will happen to you or this is what's supposed to happen. I am just being very transparent and sharing with you um, so that, you know, you can have a, 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 a understanding or a, a different perspective maybe of a passage of scripture that is there in the Bible. The king, the bride, and the tyrant. God sent Moses back to Egypt. I was reflecting on Exodus and just some passage on some verses in Exodus, right? God sent Moses back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let his people go so that they may worship him. Now that may sound selfish or self-seeking of God to want these people to worship him. But what if you think of it in the context of love? God is the groom slash hero, the people of Israel, his bride um, or his queen to be. And the tyrant would be, of course, um, fear. Now, any groom that is truly, that truly love his bride wants to protect and care for her. Not only that, a groom would also want his bride to be where he is at all times. So in this story, it is God's way of desiring to be with his bride, um, desiring to be with his bride. Of course, there are lots of things he has for her, lovely things too. And he has prepared that he has prepared for her and has gone through great length to ensure that the scene is set to rescue his bride from someone who was abusing her and misusing her. Being the hero he is, he has done many things to prove and demonstrate to his bride that he cares for her. The plague in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, were a clear demonstration that he can be trusted with his bride's life. He ensured he destroyed the tyrant that was abusing her. He provided food for her and water to drink, um, all to help her to understand that he is for her. He has the promised land for her, spread with lovely things. But before he gave it to her, he wants to give her himself. It has never, it was never about the promise or the promised land. It was about the promise giver. It was never about the gift. It was about the gift giver. It wasn't about the kingdom. It was about the king. The fairy tale, the fairy tale writers, whether they want to believe or accept it or not, were inspired to write based on the concept that God himself placed in them. The hero in these stories fight for and defend and defeat all enemies to get his girl. He is driven and nothing will ever stop him from being for stop him um, from being there for his lady. Think about it now. The lady see all he has done and yet still she refused his love and ignored 
his bravery or sacrifice. And instead of being thankful and embrace her brave hero, she complains and curses him, saying she wish she was back in Egypt where she was coming from. How do you think the king, the hero, feels about these scenarios? Of course, I suspect that he feel hurt and crushed, but yet still, he never relent. He continues to be all that he can be for the lady, or for his lady, all the while helping, hoping rather, that she will see him for who he is. He desire and, and, and want to desire him more than she desire what he has to offer. So he has prepared for her lovely things. He has chosen to give her himself before he give her the promise. He has promised or he has chosen to give her himself before he give her his kingdom. Because for the king, what is most important is that they are together in a love relationship, not based on a gift or a promise, but by two individuals who loves and care for each other. That is the Bible, the love story. God is busy at work helping to shape uh, a beautiful scenery. And we have seen it from time to time. We have seen it um, being demonstrated um, even on Easter, our brother um, demonstrating Jesus. We have read it in the scriptures. It is very clear to us that there is a God who is willing to give us himself. And he has gone to great extent. He has preserved the scriptures over 1,500 years. And yet still, it still remains as a, a, a point of reference for us today. And we have the story that there is going to come a day when Jesus himself will come and he will receive us unto himself. Because as the king, as the hero, he wants his bride, that's you and I, to be with him forever. And the scripture make it very clear that the tyrant, the enemy as it were, the devil and his angel will not stand in his way. He will bound that old dragon, said revelation, and cast him and his demons into the lake of fire. And there to live forever will be the king and his bride enjoying each, other pre each other's presence forever. And that is what the Bible is all about. Why not spend some time to get to know the king? Because you are his bride. And why not enjoy his presence now? starting today so that you will get to experience all that he has for you all that he has for you all that he has for you god is more interested in giving you himself than he is in giving you the gifts of his kingdom and so he said to moses tell pharaoh to let my people go that they may worship me and he met with them on Mount Sinai before they got to the promised land. Because God knew that if he give them the promise before he give them himself, then they will not be interested in him. God is interested in you. And if you will just open yourself to reading the scriptures, you will see that for yourself. Because God loves you. He cares for you. So here the conclusion. It is not enough to know what the Bible does for a believer. The believer must take the time to study its contents, not for knowledge or the ability to quote verses, but more so to get to know God and to know his or her role 
in God's progressive agenda. God has an agenda at work, at play. And enough for you to know what role you play in that. You have to spend time in the scripture. After all, the Bible stands for basic instruction before leaving earth. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Um, thank you so much for uh, tuning in um, to our studies tonight. I am happy to have um, been your teacher for tonight. I trust that you would have learned some things. Um, if you have learned some things, why not take the time out now to put some things in the chat so that um, we can get a uh, a sense as to what God has done for you, even as you, you study the scriptures here tonight. So I'm going to ask you to make some notes in the chat. Just make some, just say some things in the chat concerning the impact that are the way or what the scripture, uh, what you have learned from tonight's scripture um, or from tonight's studies, Rabbi. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Um, as we seek to honor the Lord with all that we have, as we seek to spend time with him and with his word. Uh, yes, it's good so, to have you. Let me just see if I can identify some persons, what they are saying in the chat here tonight. Um, right. Praise God. We give God thanks for, for what he has done. And I just want to encourage you to continue to spend time with God and with his word. Continue to spend time loving God by loving his word. The scripture encourages us that if we love him, we should keep his commandments. And how are we going to keep these commandments if we don't know what these commandments are? So we have to spend time to study the scripture for ourselves so that we can know what God is all about. Thank you so much for joining. I'm, I'm happy that you were able to join. And um, we are truly grateful that you continue to be a part of our community, um, our our YouTube channel. We are so grateful that you have you have subscribed, that you have shared, and that you you continue to invite other persons to be a part of this community. We look forward to meeting with you here each Wednesday night, and also on Sunday when we have our worship experience. We are living in unprecedented times. We are living in a, a time in which things are different. Um, but God has been good to us. He has allowed us to be able to um, connect with each other, um, connect around things that are spiritual. We are able to still read our Bibles together as a church. We're able to study the scripture together as a church. I'll be being virtual, but nonetheless, we have an opportunity to share um, with each other. And so we want to just give God thanks for that. Thank you so much for coming. If you are here for the first time, we trust that you would have been blessed by the study and that you will be able to join us next week as we continue all being well to look at the, the scripture. Um, thank you so much, my brothers and sisters, for, for that. As we as we as we depart one from another, um, I I just want to just spend some time just to just pray with you. Um, I'm not sure if Rev have any updates or anything that he would want to say. I would I would give him the opportunity if he if he so desire if he want to say anything. Um, and then if not, I will just go ahead and and pray for you. And we wish each other good night. All right. Okay, let's 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 pray. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, we want to pause to just be thankful. Just to, just to say, say thanks to you, Lord, for all that you have done. You are a very, very loving and caring God. And we thank you for that our reminder tonight. And we ask so that you will help us 
um, to uh, worship you and to enjoy your presence forever. Lord, we recognize that your word can be trusted. We recognize that your word is solid. We recognize that your word is truth. We recognize that your word reveal who you are and also who we are. And we ask, Lord, that your people will continue to spend time in your word, that, Father, as a church, as a group of believers, that, Lord, we will not uh, go weary in studying the scriptures, but we will continue, Lord, to open ourselves up to you and to allow your spirit to teach us what we are to know from the scriptures. Lord, we just ask that tonight, Lord, your presence will continue to overshadow us and that we will seek mighty God to honor you through the reading, uh, the reflection, and the actual doing of your word on a daily basis. Be with us, be with every single person who are able to join tonight. I pray, Lord, that you remember those persons who might be ill at this time, those persons who might have difficulties at this time, those persons who might have financial challenges or other challenges. Lord, I ask that your hand of mercy and love will be upon them in a very special way. We pray, mighty God, you will continue to bind us together. Thank you so much, Lord, for the gifts and the talents of your people, um, the multimedia team and the communication team who mighty God have been doing their work to help us to be able to, um, to meet with your, those persons um, who are in various places on a weekly basis. We give God thanks, we give you thanks for them, Lord. And we ask that you will continue to be with them and with their family. We commit the leadership of the church into your hands and we ask that your hand will continue to be upon our pastor. We thank you, Lord, that he, um, uh, the, the incident that happened with him recently, Mighty God, that it has been getting better with each passing day. And we are so grateful, Lord, that your mercy and your grace preserve him. Continue to be with him and with his wife and his sons. Lord, I pray you will cover them under your blood and that you will continue, oh God, to overshadow your people. I commit every single one of us into your hands, mighty God. And thank you for what you have started, the work you are doing in our heart through your word. May we continue to yield ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much, my brothers and sisters. God bless you. Um, God bless you.